to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the Thessalonians turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Welcome to our study of the book of First and Second Thessalonians. As we think about the background for these books, it's found in Acts chapter 17. The book of Acts is a history book of many of the letters that we find Paul writing, and the history of the books of First and Second Thessalonians is found in Acts chapter 17. Here's what happened. As Paul went into the region of Thessalonica, there was a Jewish synagogue there. As was his custom, he went into that synagogue and preached Christ to them, proving and affirming from the Scriptures that he was the Messiah. As a result, some of the Jews and a multitude of devout Greeks, including a few leading women in that city, obeyed the gospel and were saved. As a result, the church began there in Thessalonica. But everybody wasn't happy there. Some of the Jews who did not believe the gospel, who were bent on their own power and pride, caused a persecution to arise. Members of the church, Jason and his house, were taken as surety. Paul is ushered out of the city. And thus the Bible makes this comment about the Bereans, but it relates to the Thessalonians in Acts 17 verse 11. The Bible says of the Bereans, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonians. Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. No doubt there were some in Thessalonica who were noble or fair-minded, but many of the Jews were not, and thus there were problems from without, and there are problems from within that Paul is going to write to deal with. Now, mainly... The books of First and Second Thessalonians deal with problems relating to the second coming of Christ. Some of these Christians now haven't been faithful real long, but they've been faithful long enough to maybe have a friend or a relative or someone die in Christ. And so the question arises, what's going to happen to these Christians who've died and gone on? What about us who are waiting when the Lord comes? What's going to happen? And Paul deals with that in First Thessalonians chapter 4, Verse 13 following. In fact, every chapter in 1 Thessalonians will close with some idea about the second coming. And so this book is permeated with ideas relating to the second coming. However, there are also just some very basic principles for Christian living taught. For example, in chapter 1, Paul is going to write and encourage these Christians for their faithfulness, their work of faith, labor of love, and their hope of patience. Paul is going to answer some criticisms and some questions that have been raised in chapter 2. He deals with problems, problems related to fornication, chapter 4, verse 4, problems that are related to idleness, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, and their need to respect the elders. But again, the main problem is that of the second coming and the resurrection. How does all this tie into their life now and what should they be doing in response to the second coming? But as we begin chapter 1, You'll notice this group, these Christians, had a triune approach to Christianity, a triune approach to their faith, and this is what they had. Notice 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 3. Paul writes and says, Remembering without ceasing, notice, your work of faith, labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. How did they approach Christianity? Paul commends this group for their work of faith. Friends, faith is not something you feel and you just sit around and it just happens. Faith is something we do. We put our trust in God. It's based on Scripture. Romans 10 verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But faith is never just sitting around and waiting. Faith is active. James chapter 2, verse 14 following, James says, You show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Can you prove your faith without ever doing something? 
Absolutely not. You couldn't prove you were faithful unless you did something. And thus, in Hebrews 11, every time after this statement, by faith, there is an action that occurs to approve that. And thus, faith is always active and working. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Jesus said in John 9, verse 4, We must work the works of Him who sent us while it's day, for night comes when no man works. But what was the motive for the work of faith? It was their labor of love. Friend, what you do for the cause of Christ must be motivated by love. Ephesians 4.15, the Bible says we're to speak the truth in love. Mark chapter 12, verse 33, following the greatest commandment of all, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, how is it that we get this labor of love? We first must recognize just how much God loved us and let that be the motivating factor. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. When I think about how deeply God has loved me and, and when you think about how deeply God loves you, He loved you so much that He sent His own Son. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, God's not slow concerning His promises as some men count slowness, but wants all men everywhere to repent. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, when I realize the grand fact that God sent His Son out of the ivory palaces of heaven to live and die as a man on earth, Friend, that's what motivated their labor. That's what was propelling them and pushing them every day to get out and work for God. And so they had a work of faith motivated by their labor of love which caused patience of hope or perseverance of hope. What was it that kept them enduring? What was it that made them in the midst of their trials and struggles in a sin-sick society keep on keeping on? It was their perseverance of hope. Friend, where would we be without hope? This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Hebrews 6, verse 18 and 19. We're living in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Titus 1, verse 2. And it's this hope that keeps us going every day. Paul said in Romans 5 and again in Romans 8, we're saved in hope. Not that hope itself saves us, but that's what keeps us focused on salvation. Well, what do we mean by perseverance or patience of hope? Friend, Jesus said this, being faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Here's the promise He made to you. Revelation 2 verse 10, 1 John 2 verse 25. This is the promise we have, eternal life. You have the hope. We're not talking about wishful thinking here. We're talking about something you can be sure about. You're just longingly anticipating. You have the hope of living with God beyond this life if you remain faithful. And so they had a work of faith motivated by labor out of love and it was all deeply rooted in their perseverance of the hope that God had given them. But you know in this message in 1 Thessalonians 1, Paul also reminds these Christians of their election, that they were chosen or elected by God. Now when we talk about election in the Bible, and when it's used in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4, we're not talking about somehow God chooses some to be saved and some to be lost, and there's nothing you can do about that. True election is this, God votes for us, the devil votes against us, we cast the deciding ballot. God's already voted for all men, has He not? God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, no doubt the devil is actively doing everything he can to get all to be lost. You see that in Scripture. Well, who makes that final decision? We do. Look, look in the Bible. Notice 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 10. Peter is going to write this, and he's going to encourage Christians, be more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, Peter says, you'll never stumble. Who's responsible for making their calling and election sure? We are. We've got to be more diligent to make our own calling and election sure. We make the final decision because we are free moral agents and we decide whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. Now, I understand it's only possible by God's grace. I understand the devil's actively doing everything he can to tempt us, but I am a free moral agent. I do decide 
if I go to heaven or if I go to hell. Remember what Joshua said? Joshua 24 verse 15. Joshua said, choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve. Whether the God's on the other side or whether you're going to serve the true and living God. They had a choice to make and so do we. And it's not just everybody who looks up and says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven. But those who do the will of the Father. But as you look in 1 Thessalonians 1, one of the things we also learned was the powerful gospel these people received, it gave them great assurance. They had assurance of their faith because of their obedience to the powerful gospel. They didn't receive these things just as any ordinary thing. This was received with power. The powerful gospel is what gave them this great assurance. And friend, the powerful gospel is what gives every person true assurance. Our hope, our assurance is not based in words or thinking or ideas of men. Our assurance is based in the power of the gospel. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 1 verse 16. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. Where's the power at? It's in the gospel. What do we mean by gospel? The good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus came and lived a perfect life, that He was buried, that He was raised again the third day, and that He was resurrected to heaven, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. That's where our assurance is. And friend, you can be sure, it is something we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Here's what's great about Christianity. You don't have to worry you don't have to wonder and you don't have to doubt. If you've obeyed the gospel and if you're living faithful to God, you can be sure you're right with Him. 1 John 5 verse 13, John says, this is why he wrote, These things I write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, listen, that you may know you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Not that you can wonder, not that you could have some kind of earthly hope, but that you can know you have hope. Now, why was it these Thessalonians had such great hope and assurance? Here's why. These people had truly changed their lives. The Thessalonians ever stand as an example of true repentance. I want you to notice in your Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Here's what's said about these Christians. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. Now notice how you turn to God from idols to serve the true and living God or the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Notice, this is true repentance. True repentance is a turn. They turn to God from idols, and then they went to work to serve the living and true God. And so how would we define repentance? Repentance is a 180 degree turn from sin to God. That's what God expects us to do. Luke chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, certain Jewish elite of the day came out to be baptized by John. And here's what John said, you need to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. What does that tell us? Repentance is not just saying you're sorry. 2 Corinthians 7 10 says godly sorrow produces repentance. But repentance, sorrow in and of itself is not repentance. No doubt the Thessalonians were sorrowful for their sin, but their sorrow motivated them to turn to God from idols and notice to serve the true and living God. You can always tell if a person is truly repented by the works that he does. Think about the example in Matthew 21, verses 28 through 30. Jesus told this illustration. He said, a father had two sons. He said to his son, son, go work in my field today. The son said he would, but he never did. And then he said to the second son, son, go work in my field today. The son looked at him and said, no way. Later changed his mind, then he went and worked in the father's field. And Jesus said, which of these two did the will of the father? The son who said he would, and never did, or the son who said he wouldn't, changed his mind and followed it up by going and working in the Father's field. And they said the latter, and right they were, because Jesus' teaching was repentance is a changed will that leads to a changed way. In chapter 2 then, we also learn concerning the Thessalonians that Paul's preaching the gospel was not in vain. Paul says, our preaching was not in vain among you. There were some who heard the word and obeyed it. There were some who heard the word and rejected it. But friend, the preaching of the gospel is never in vain. God said in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 7 through 11, 
my word shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that for which I have sent it. What's that mean? Whether people reject it and are lost or whether people obey it and are saved, God's word always accomplishes its purpose. God has revealed himself to man. He has given people an opportunity. They are responsible for obeying God's word. You see, the power, my friends, is in the gospel. Romans 1.16, it's the power of God. Listen to these words. Hebrews 4.12 is a powerful verse about God's word having inherent power to change people's lives. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so as Paul writes, Paul wants them to know, look, the power's not in me, the power's not in you, the power's in the gospel, and it's never in vain when we preach God's Word. However, there is going to be persecution. And in verse 2, Paul writes about this persecution. And Paul writes and says this persecution that happened, in essence, was actually good for us, that the gospel might be promoted and go on. Preaching the gospel and persecution, Paul knew went hand in hand. And Paul let persecution for him be like gasoline on a fire. Acts chapter 14, Paul arose and said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Paul didn't get down or discouraged. He said, hey, this is the way it's got to be. Let's let it motivate us. Acts chapter 17, they were persecuted. Paul went on preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 19, every chapter you look at, as persecution arises, it seems to motivate Paul to keep doing the will of God. And friend, we've got to realize that persecution is going to happen and it can be a sign that we're living right. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, the Bible says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, not might, but will suffer persecution. And you know, when persecution comes, let's not get that frown on our face and think that God's against us and we're doing something wrong. The Bible says, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. And so it is something we can look at with joy because we're fulfilling the will of God. But you know, with the privilege of preaching also comes the responsibility to only please God. And Paul understood this. Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. Paul said this, as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak. Now notice, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Paul writes and says, the gospel's not in vain. This persecution happened, actually worked out for our benefit and for yours. And whether it did or not, we've got to preach the gospel trying only to please God. Too many people miss the mark because they're trying to please God the wrong person. Paul said in Galatians 1 verse 10, if I were still trying to please men, I'd not be a servant of Christ. We need to realize that when we obey the gospel and we dedicate and say to ourselves, I'm going to become a Christian, I've only got one person that I've got to make happy. Seek first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We've got to realize that our main goal as a child of God is not to make the world happy, not to go around and take a pole, not to hold our finger in the air and see which way the wind's blowing. Our main goal has been, always will be, to please God and Him alone. And if our goal is to please God and others' goal is to please God, Oh, we're going to work together. We're going to have great harmony. That's why we've got to preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season. That's why we've got to get away from all these man-made ideas and traditions. And regardless, if people get offended or not, the Bible says in Galatians 4 verse 16, you don't become somebody's enemy when you preach the truth. Paul said, if I become your enemy by telling you the truth, when we say what God says, we have one responsibility, to please Him and Him alone. My life, is about pleasing God. Now, I'm not saying go out and be mean and unkind. That's not what we're talking about. But our main goal in this life is to please God. And if God's happy, the world doesn't matter. As long as I'm pleasing God, it doesn't matter what the world or society thinks. I've got to put God first in my life. Now, you notice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
verses 5 and 6, Paul is going to relate how that some have done a lot of harm in the religious world by doing their things out of the wrong motives. Some are preaching out of money. Some are motivated for power and pride. And Paul is going to talk about that in verses 5 and 6. And the point he's making is we're not doing that. We're not here because of our own power or pride. We're not trying to make money off you like some are. You know, a lot of harm has been done in the religious world by people who quote, were religious leaders who sounded good, but were only in it for the money. We found out about these people. Religious leaders in the past who would get on TV and say, just send in X amount of dollars. You're helping so-and-so in such-and-such place to obey the gospel. And come to find out, they were padding their own pocket, taking people's Social Security checks, and using those to fund their own luxurious lifestyle. Friends, that's not the way Christianity is. Paul said that's not what we did, and that's not what preaching the gospel is about today. We're not in it for the money. We're in it for the saving of people's souls. But here's a powerful verse. I want you to look in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 2. Those who the gospel is preached to also have responsibility. Their responsibility is to study, Acts 17, 11, and if it's the Word of God, to accept it as truth. Look at, look at the responsibility of the hearers. Verse 13 is such a, a powerful passage. Paul said, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Paul said, here's something that's noteworthy about you. When we came and preached the gospel, you didn't accept it as the words of men. You searched it, you, searched it, you studied it, you saw it as the Word of God, and you accepted it as that truth. The responsibility of every person who hears the gospel preached is to do two things. Number one, to make sure that what you're hearing is true to the Word of God. And number two, if it is, obey it because God said it, not because man said it. Think about Acts 17, 11 again. Paul goes into the region of Berea. He preaches the gospel to them, and the Bible says they received it with readiness of mind. They were ready to hear what he said. What they do then? Automatically accept it? No. They searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. They heard the word. They checked it to make sure it was from God, and if it was, they obeyed it because God said it, not because men said it. When the word is preached, you have a responsibility. Make sure. And this is very important because a lot of people have gone astray on this point. Make sure that what's being taught is true to the Word of God. And someone says, with so much error, how do we do that? Here's how. Here's a real simple way. When the gospel's preached, make sure that someone says, and here's where the Bible says that. Don't let somebody say to you, well, we believe, or popular opinion says, or uh, so-and-so who's a religious leader said, if you want to be sure that you're right with God, Make sure that what you're hearing comes from the Bible. When someone says, to be saved, you need to do such and such, and here's where the Bible says that, you get your Bible and see, you study it and check for yourself, and then if it's true, don't obey it because that person said it. Obey it because God said it. And if it's true, you're responsible to accept it as the Word of God. And just like those in the first century, we've got to become imitators of the churches of Christ in that area. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 14, Paul commends these people because they became imitators of him and of the churches in that region. We need to do the same thing. What are we striving to be? Aren't we supposed to be striving to be the people you read about in the New Testament, to be the church that Jesus established? We need to be like them in the first century. Listen to what they did in Acts 2 verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. How can we be imitators of the first century Christians when we continue in the apostles' doctrine? Not the teaching of men, when we continue in the apostles' fellowship, who they had fellowship with, the apostles breaking of bread, their fellowship, their prayers, their teaching. We've got to continue in what they did. Well, how do we do that? By seeing what they did and following their pattern. And thus, we need to imitate people, Christians, the teaching of the New Testament. But hey, let's realize also, evil people 
and Satan are going to do everything they can to hinder us in this endeavor. Paul says in verses 15 and 16 that certain evil people have got in the way and they're going to be punished for that and Satan himself is also trying to hindering the spread of, hindering the spread of the word of God in verse 18. There are evil people who do not want the gospel preached because it contradicts their lifestyle. It makes them feel guilty when we preach about righteousness and godly living and the grace of God which teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly, righteously, and godly. There are always going to be people who object to that because they want to live in sin and do what they want. Evil people are always going to try to hinder the gospel, but here's what you can know. One day, those people are going to reap a very serious punishment. The Bible says in the same book or the next part of Paul's letter in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 that the Lord is coming in flaming fire to take vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel and those who do not live according to the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Their day of punishment is coming, but let's remember who's really behind it. Satan is the real hindrance to the gospel message today. In verse 18, Paul will say very clearly, Satan hindered us. And friends, at times, Satan does what he can to hinder God's people. You know he did that in the book of Job. Job chapter 1 and 2, all the events that occurred, Job's children dying, his loss of all his wealth, the health in chapter 2. Who did that? Satan did. Let's realize Satan is an active hindrance to gospel preaching and to true Christian living. Think about these words in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. The Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's true, my friends, that Satan is doing everything he can to hinder us. Don't let him hinder you. Are you sure that you've done what the Christians in Thessalonica did? Are you sure that you're right with God? Have you believed in Jesus as the Son of God? In John 8 verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Having believed in Jesus, have you repented of your sins? Have you turned to God from your sin to serve the true and living God? First Thessalonians 1 verse 9, Have you confessed? the name of Jesus before men, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And have you been baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Friend, if you've not done those things, the devil is still having his way with you. You need to change your life and obey the gospel. And friends, we say that so that you can have the hope of heaven. May each of us be really committed to living for Christ every day. May we have a work of faith, labor of love, and perseverance of hope knowing that we're trying every day to do the best we can to serve God. May God bless each of us as we strive to live for the gospel of Christ every day of our life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your life. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.